So hello everyone. Uh, 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 welcome to the Axon or the Event Driven Conferences, Microservices Conferences 2020. Uh, my name is uh, Vijay Nair. Uh, I'm based out of uh, sunny California, rather fairy California, considering the number of fires that are going on uh, right now. Uh, I'm uh, an architect at large, uh, an independent uh, DDD CQRS evangelist, uh, and I'm going to be talking about. Uh, Quite an interesting topic uh, is the usage of uh, Axon and Kafka together to implement robust uh, event-driven architectures. Uh, we will talk about uh, what each tool does best, uh, which category it fits in within the whole event-driven architecture paradigm and ecosystem. And then we will look at, uh, finally, we'll wrap up uh, by talking about how uh, these two work well together. Once you combine them, uh, you know, it's something that's going to be quite uh, easy to then roll out robust even driven uh, microservices infrastructure. So uh, with that said, I'm going to start off with the presentation. Um, uh, so as I said, so my name is Vijay. Uh, I'm also, I, I a couple of things that I missed out was, I'm an author of the book, Practical Domain Driven Design with Enterprise Java, uh, sold by Appress. Uh, I'm, all, I'm also writing a series of small essays around implementing CQRS, the Pocket Guide on LeanPub. Uh, I also act as an InfoQ editor for the architecture and design stream. Uh, and finally, uh, these are my email addresses and the Twitter account. So uh, before we talk about uh, the combination of Axon and Kafka, let's spend a bit about uh, the whole event-driven architecture paradigm. Uh, now, even driven architectures have been around for quite a long time, uh, you know, close to around three to four decades, uh, and it essentially focuses on two core principles. Uh, you're basically building applications uh, centered around the generation and handling of events. Uh, these are the two core principles, and the only two principles that even driven architectures are actually comprised of. Uh, and the applications could be of any type. It could be online applications. Uh, it could be uh, applications which are based on integration, uh, analytics applications. If any of these application types want to follow uh, the event driven architecture paradigm, it's essentially uh, catering to these two core principles, uh, which is around the generation as well as the handling of events. Now, having been uh, around for a long time, uh, the event driven architectures, uh, the event driven architecture has gained. Um, you know, it's, go it's undergoing a renaissance of sorts. Uh, and by that, what I mean is there has been large scale innovations uh, within the EDA ecosystem uh, in the past three to five years. And it's primarily fu fueled by uh, this new class of applications that are being built by enterprises today, uh, fueled by the whole microservices revolution, uh, the cloud native philosophy, uh, the reactive philosophy of uh, building uh, real modern applications. Uh, they need to kind of be reactive in real time. Uh, so they need to react to events uh, to enable businesses to make critical decisions, not in days, but within seconds of uh, of uh, changes that are happening within applications. Uh, they are need to be distributed and that's essentially driven by the microservices uh, philosophy. Applications are getting more and more distributed. And finally, scalable applications. You don't want to build applications uh, which are kind of, uh, you know, restricted by uh, the architecture itself. And applications uh, are tending to be more and more scalable. Uh, they need to adopt uh, patterns which help them build that. Essentially, events are the glue for all of these uh, principles again. And that's why the EDA renaissance, as I call it, uh, has, been, uh, has, become, has come to the fore. Uh, there have been so many innovations in this area that people have really started taking events uh, or the event-driven architecture seriously again. Uh, two such patterns that have made uh, you know, large leaps and bounds uh, in the whole uh, EDA ecosystem are basically event sourcing and event streaming. Uh, that's something that we're going to talk about in detail a little bit more. Uh, but uh, event sourcing and event streaming have really uh, pushed uh, the EDA uh, pattern uh, right at the center of modern uh, of the new class of modern applications that are being built. Uh, they, they enable applications to be reactive. Uh, they enable applications to be distributed as well as highly scalable and maintainable, all keeping events, uh, all uh, and 
keeping events at the center uh, of uh, these uh, of this architecture. So uh, event sourcing and event streaming uh, are of course just two patterns. There are other patterns that have been around for quite a bit uh, within the EDA ecosystem as such, uh, but event sourcing and event streaming have really uh, gained prominence of late. And we're gonna talk about uh, essentially a, a background of what uh, these patterns mean, uh, what exactly goes into building or implementing these patterns and the two tools that are leading the charge uh, in uh, in these two patterns. Of course, from an event streaming perspective, uh, Kafka has really pioneered the concept of event streaming. And we'll talk about how Axon uh, has taken the lead in providing a robust enter uh, enterprise grade uh, event sourcing infrastructure. So that's what I call the EDA Renaissance. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's really uh, it really helps quite a bit uh, in this new class of modern applications, as I said, you know, being reactive, uh, they're distributed uh, as well as scalable. So let's talk about event streaming a little bit uh, first. And of course, uh, it's 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 something that is quite you know a lot of people are familiar with this pattern today. Uh, as I said, so the, the architectural pattern of event streaming uh, basically advocates uh, the design and development of applications uh, by publishing events as well as subscribing uh, to a constant stream of events and finally processing them. That's all that there is to event streaming. So applications are continuously publishing uh, a stream of events and you know applications are constantly subscribing to this uh, stream of events and they're processing them as these, as these events occur. Of course, this is pioneered by Kafka, uh, and as you can see, uh, you know, a small depiction that's shown up there is, uh, it's essentially team, team in principles. You publish events, you subscribe to these events, and then build applications around processing or handling these events in real time. And then you have kind of a, a bit of an event storage uh, around these, uh, about the events that are being published as well as subscribed uh, by various applications. Even sourcing, on the other hand, uh, advocates uh, the design and development of applications by treating applications as a system of state, uh, as a system of events rather than as a system of state. What it essentially means is that even sourcing uh, states that the state of an application and the state of the application is generally uh, determined by the state of its various entities. Uh, and since even sourcing borrows, or is, 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 it originates from the domain-driven design world, uh, the state of the application is essentially uh, through the state of the various aggregates uh, of uh, of an application. So what event sourcing essentially states uh, is that the state of the application, what it mandates is that the state of the application and hence the state of its various aggregates should not be explicitly stored in a database, uh, but as a series of state changing events. And uh, let's take an example. Uh, I mean, of course, from a banking perspective uh, or from a uh, from balance perspective, your account balance, uh, in the in in the old world uh, of building applications or in state uh, stored world, you would just have a table with a balance uh, with a balance table and the a balance table and the balance of an account stored as the state of the, the account balance at that point of time. Uh, what even sourcing essentially states is that uh, is that you're not going to store the balance per se, uh, but you're going to store uh, the transactions uh, that have happened across on that particular account as it happens on uh, the event, as it happens on the particular account. Uh, so you're just storing the various debits and credits uh, are essentially events that have happened on the account, uh, which in turn reflect the balance, but we don't store the balance per se on it. So that's what event sourcing typically uh, is all about. So uh, again, uh, just to recap, so it's, it's, it's an architectural pattern that advocates uh, the design of uh, development of applications by treating it as a system of events. Uh, rather than a system of state. Um, and the state is represented by its various aggregates, uh, basically the business entities uh, that model the core business of an application. Uh, and uh, just, to, just to go back to my previous point, uh, since event sourcing is generated in the domain-driven design world, uh, the state is essentially uh, represented by its various aggregates and the business entities uh, that, have, uh, that are there within the core business uh, of an application. So any operation on an aggregate essentially results uh, in an event that describes the state change of the aggregate. And that's the event that gets stored uh, in the event database. And that's what event sourcing is all about. Uh, you're, not going to, you're not going to store the state of the aggregate per se, uh, but you're going to store all the events that have happened against the aggregate 
in the event database or the event store as we call it. Now, if you need to replay or arrive at the current state of an aggregate, it is then uh, reconstructed by loading all the events that have happened on the aggregate and replaying it. But that's how, uh, that's how the state of an aggregate is constructed. Uh, whereas in the, in the other world uh, or in the state world, uh, you just have, uh, you know, you just query the balance table and then uh, you just retrieve the balance against a particular account. Now, event sourcing is almost always used with another pattern, uh, which is the CQRS pattern uh, or the command query uh, responsibility segregation pattern. Uh, essentially, uh, what CQRS states is that we've got commands which change the state of an aggregate or which cause the state, uh, uh, which cause the change of state of an aggregate, which results in an event. And these events are subscribed by the queries on the other side, uh, which then uh, construct various aggregations uh, of uh, the aggregate, sorry, which construct various projections uh, of the balance uh, in a format that's consumable by uh, the consumers on the other side or, or, or the consumers of the query side. So CQRS essentially advocates two models, the command model and the query model. And the command model is what uh, the operations are where the operations of the aggregate happen. It results in an event. And then uh, on the query side, they subscribe to these events and construct projections of the aggregate. You're not constructing the aggregate per se, but you're constructing projections of the aggregate or various representations of the balance aggregate of the command side. Now, these could be, uh, uh, there is no specific terminology for a model on the query side. You don't have essentially the same concept of aggregates on that side, but you ju it's just a model. So it could be a NoSQL database. It could be a relational database. Essentially, these are just projections or various representations of the aggregate, in our case, the balance uh, that's there. Looking at a visual depiction of what event sourcing is all about, uh, you know, events, uh, as you can see, so uh, any, every time there is an operation or an aggregate or what we call a command uh, represented by the yellow circles, an event gets stored in the database. It says the event is essentially is uh, uh, the state change uh, recorded. Uh, or this, the change of state of an aggregate that's recorded as in an append-only fashion. To arrive at the state of an aggregate at any point of time, we load all the past events that have happened on the aggregate and replay the events that have occurred on that aggregate. And that's how what event sourcing is primarily all about. If you look at the CQRS that's used uh, in conjunction with event sourcing, you got the command model, essentially the operations that are happening on that. Uh, these command models generate events and then we've got projections uh, of these uh, of these of the of the state of an application, uh, which are essentially representations of the aggregate in various formats, in various forms. So, how do we go about implementing event sourcing? Uh, so, implementing event sourcing involves uh, a set of concerns around uh, three main aspects. Of course, it's all about event storage. You need to store events as as and when they have occurred on an aggregate in an append-only fashion. Events are never replaced because you always want to know what has occurred within uh, for a particular aggregate. So events are always appended and it needs to be appended quickly as well as read quickly to construct state as I told you before. So you need, so there are a lot of concerns that are there around event storage. So there is domain driven design obviously because uh, event sourcing uh, you know, originated from this world uh, you know, and it works with state and state changes. Uh, you know, it's essentially, uh, it's all modeled as aggregates. And that's where domain-driven design plays an important role because you need to model your aggregates uh, accordingly. And finally, from a CQRS, uh, you need to implement concerns, uh, certain aspects of CQRS because you need to generate events as well as subscribe or you handle these events to construct the corresponding projections. So these are the three main core principles that event sourcing advocates implementation for. And implementation generally requires, uh, you know, is done through a combination of a physical infrastructure as well as a logical infrastructure in my view. So the physical infrastructure is obviously the event store, uh, you know, which acts as the database for the events. So the physical infrastructure stores the events, it should have the capability to store these events extremely fast in an append-only fashion. It needs to have the capability to read these events uh, in an extremely fast, uh, the capability to read these events in an extremely fast manner again, centered around what has happened around a particular aggregate uh, for which we're storing these events for. Uh, implementing event sourcing uh, also requires uh, a logical infrastructure. That means you need a framework which provides an API 
to model uh, aggregates, uh, handle the commands and queries, as well as perform event sourcing operations. That's uh, persist events as well as uh, read events to construct straight. The, the combination of these two essentially helps you implement or roll out robust uh, event sourcing uh, infrastructure if you decide to go down the event sourcing paradigm. So again, just to repeat myself, there's a physical infrastructure that is the database which acts as the central storage for events. And of course, the physical infrastructure is responsible for storing events as well as reading events in an extremely fast manner, uh, as well as logical infrastructure, which is basically the framework which helps you interact with the event store uh, or the physical infrastructure in an easy to use manner. Uh, looking at what uh, I came up with, the capability map for event sourcing. Uh, so if you look at the top part, uh, that's basically the physical infrastructure and the bottom part is, uh, is the logical infrastructure. So the event store or the physical infrastructure uh, that is used within event sourcing infrastructures need to provide a capability to append events uh, at the same time provide consistency, uh, atomicity and durability uh, for the events that are being stored. You do need, you do need to ensure that uh, there is a consistent record uh, of an event that has occurred on an aggregate because it's a database after all, and you do not want to lose events. So the, the, the aspects of consistency, atomicity and durability are extremely high, just like any other regular uh, database uh, that you would use to store state. So the event store needs to provide that. At the same time, it needs to also provide the capability to read events extremely fast. So all the events that have happened on an aggregate, uh, it could be all events since point of time for an aggregate to help construct projections, uh, as well as ad hoc current capabilities, as well as isolation. So the, the reading of events is extremely important and as critical as the append of events uh, that are happening. And the event store needs to provide both of them. The event store also needs to provide the capability to be extremely available, extremely highly available. Uh, uh, you know, it's like any other piece of your infrastructure. You wouldn't want your uh, main database which shows the events to go down. So you need to make it highly available with the capability to fail over fast, uh, extremely scalable, and finally the capability to route events. And uh, I think uh, the routing of events, uh, it's, 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 it's an extremely important thing because you need to kind of route these events to handlers that are working on the query side. So the event store needs to act as the messaging uh, layer too, and the capability to route these events <coughs> onto the query side too. So the event store has got these three main capabilities, so three main areas that need to be provided from a physical infrastructure perspective. From a logical infrastructure perspective, uh, you know, there needs to be an API in place that helps deal uh, with these event sourcing operations. Uh, and event sourcing operations uh, from, uh, from a modeling perspective, you need to generate, uh, you need to model capability to model aggregates, uh, generate events, uh, you know, capability to replay events, handle exceptions that happen when handling events, uh, publish the events and finally event uh, uh, provide the capability to version events. And the framework needs to take care of all these concerns. If you start implementing these on your own, you quickly realize the complexity that is associated with the operations that can occur uh, during an event sourcing, uh, during the event sourcing pattern, using the event sourcing pattern. So the framework, uh, there should be a framework in place uh, that you should use uh, when you are uh, kind of uh, want to implement the event sourcing uh, operations against an event store. So the capability map uh, that is shown uh, shows you all the possible uh, non-functional requirements, as you may call it, for implementing the or for rolling out an event sourcing infrastructure. And as you can see, uh, it's not uh, it's not a very easy thing to do. Uh, event sourcing is complex. Uh, of course, it comes with extremely high benefits, but it is complex to roll out or build out something uh, on your own. Uh, and generally you're better off uh, in using something uh, which provides uh, or a platform which provides you these capabilities that's there. Now, of course, uh, the main, the main uh, core, uh, the main crux of this uh, talk is people generally look at event sourcing and say, okay, fine. Uh, so why don't I just look at uh, Kafka uh, as for using my event store, uh, for, for rolling out my event sourcing infrastructure. I already use Kafka today, uh, and that's that's quite a pretty uh, that's quite a, a common. Um, I'm sorry, and that's quite a common thing uh, that that's in systems that's in 
applications or in enterprises today. Uh, there, there is a large scale investment in Kafka today as a central event processing infrastructure. And for obvious reasons, Kafka does provide uh, you know, a solution to the problem that uh, enterprises have had for a long time, essentially being reactive in real time. So uh, there, is, there is a thought process uh, that generally starts off when people want to start adopting event sourcing is to, hey, we've got Kafka in place. Why don't I just extend it to uh, build out my event sourcing infrastructure too? And that's a fair choice. I mean, that's not, that's not something that's uh, right or wrong. It's the, it's the obvious choice when you start off on the event sourcing journey. And how do people generally uh, start doing that is, uh, as I said, uh, the, events, the event sourcing, uh, they start mapping the capabilities that are required in event sourcing uh, with what is provided by Kafka. Uh, and let's look at a couple of uh, these things which are there. So event sourcing, of course, requires the fast storage, uh, the, the append-only storage, as well as reading of aggregate events. Uh, so, uh, so customers or enterprises generally start uh, with designing Kafka topics uh, to serve as the event store, because Kafka does provide you uh, a persistent log uh, at the topic level to store events that are happening. Now, uh, uh, now that's where the first. That's when you start running into the first set of problems. When you start with a single partition topic per aggregate, you know you quickly start running into problems of scale for obvious reasons. The minute you have millions of aggregate instances, there'll be just too many topics, and that's something that Kafka themselves don't recommend. So that's something that then gets uh, you know uh, you quickly start running into problems of scale. Uh, you know once the number of instances of the aggregate start building up. So the, the single partition topic for aggregate quickly gets pushed out. And then there could, uh, the other thought process that generally happens is, okay, let's have a single partition topic for all aggregate types, right? So let's lower the number of topics uh, that we want to build by classifying these aggregates as certain types. And then let's have topics around those, uh, the single partition topic around those aggregate types. Now, uh, while that's, that's, that's a good solution, Quickly, uh, you start realizing that as the number of events grows on particular aggregate types, you know the reading of events become extremely slow because you need to read the entire data set of aggregate types. So that also quickly uh, becomes a problem uh, for folks wanting to implement uh, this basic uh, aspect of event sourcing, which is the append and reading of aggregate events. Uh, generally, then you start uh, looking at, okay, can I use something else along with Kafka? And then Kafka has got uh, uh, a very uh, nice uh, state storage mechanism using Kafka Streams. And of course, what Streams does is uh, it provides the concept of state stores for people familiar with the Kafka world. And then, uh, and, then, uh, these, uh, and then customers or enterprises decide, okay, let's start using the concept of state stores that's provided by Kafka Streams. And then we could store the aggregates uh, event stream as snapshots. Fabulous solution, but unfortunately the only problem with Streams is that stores only the current snapshots. So then you can't start building the read models because read models typically require all the events that have happened on a particular aggregate to enable the construction of those uh, of, of projections. So this also unfortunately starts becoming a problem because streams generally have uh, the problem of just storing the current snapshot. It's not a problem per se, but it's the way streams were designed to just have the current snapshot for a particular uh, reason for event sourcing, for event streaming, sorry. And when it comes to the event sourcing aspect, you suddenly realize that streams would not, would not, cannot provide you the same capability uh, that a regular event store uh, would provide you for that. Finally, from, uh, from an API perspective, uh, Kafka is only limited to a certain set, subset of operations. Again, Kafka is primarily used in the event streaming world uh, so, you know, the operations are catered more for event streaming. So basically the publishing of events and handling of events. So there are a lot of operations that you would generally have in event sourcing around uh, snapshots, uh, uh, other likes, which, uh, you know, Kafka cannot provide to you out of the box. You would have to start building it around it. So essentially, uh, you know, Kafka shines when it comes to event streaming, but when you start taking Kafka and map it to the capability map that I showed you before, uh, from an event sourcing perspective, uh, you quickly realize that Kafka is really not the right tool uh, when it comes to uh, you know when it comes to building out your rolling out your event sourcing infrastructure. Now, from from an from an Axon perspective, uh, Axon's you know purpose built from the word go, uh, you know to be 
uh, to roll out, to help you roll out your own event sourcing infrastructure. Uh, it provides you two main things. It provides you the Axon framework, and then it provides you the Axon uh, and the Axon server. So the framework helps you, uh, the, the server helps you, uh, you know, uh, the server is an enterprise grade event store, uh, which, which tick marks, you know, all the boxes that are required from an event sourcing operation perspective. So Axon server can happen events fast. Uh, they've got the capability they provide uh, consistency, atomicity, and durability, as well as the capability to generate snapshots out of the box. Uh, you can read events. Axon provides multiple index types, which are specifically geared towards event sourcing to help you read far, to help read events extremely fast. And uh, so these include index types and aggregates. And you know, with 4.4, there have been more announcements done around the way events are read. Uh, with you know, primary and local storage uh, and secondary storage. So th the whole uh, Axon server concept builds around purpose-built capabilities for event sourcing. It is, uh, again, uh, highly available. Uh, it, it can be deployed. It uses the RAP protocol for uh, distribution, so extremely scalable, and it acts as a message router. And Axon essentially elevates the concept of event sourcing by not only treating events as messages, it also treats commands and queries as messages. And that's something unique in the event sourcing world. Uh, so for Axon, everything is a message, be command queries and events, and it provides an enterprise grade uh, message router, which can be used to route these message types, which are commands, queries, and events to various uh, cooperating services. In addition to the server, we also have the Axon framework. And the Axon framework is, uh, you know, it's, it's a Java-based framework, which helps you deal with uh, Axon server uh, as the event store. It provides you a complete list of capabilities that you can use to uh, perform any kind of operations around uh, the Axon server event store. This includes uh, aggregate models, uh, generation of events, uh, even handling through the concept of uh, event processes. Uh, it, it provides you the capability to create snapshots and finally pretty comprehensive exception handling uh, when you're dealing with events. So uh, how do you combine both of them together? And you know, uh, I think there is, uh, uh, as I said before, so there are two specific areas that we talked about during this whole presentation. One was, of course, uh, event, st event streaming, and the other one was event sourcing. Both of them are two different, you know, they serve two different purposes as such. And Axon and Kafka have been built for that. So if Kafka was built you know, with the purpose of being an event streaming platform, you know, helping applications build, uh, you know, react the events that are happening and build you know another set suite of applications around it and it shines in that role there's no doubt that kafka is the leading or the dominant event processing infrastructure in place today uh, axon on the other hand was built with the purpose of being an event sourcing platform and it shines in that role uh, the the, uh, the suite uh, the axon suite provides you capabilities that help you roll out uh, uh, an event sourcing infrastructure from day one you know, it's it's just, you know, you drop it in and you start building out your event sourcing capabilities, which is similar to Kafka. You drop Kafka in and you build your event streaming capabilities from day one. So uh, how do we combine these? And uh, that's that's something that we've seen. Uh, I think that uh, that we've seen a lot of implementations that happen where uh, customers do want to rely on Kafka uh, as well as use Axon from an event sourcing perspective. So they want to continue using Kafka from a streaming perspective because they have built the ecosystem around it. And they want to start using event sourcing, and they want to use Axon for that. So uh, essentially, uh, what uh, can be done is, uh, you know, you have Axon, which provides the support for the domain model as well as event sourcing operations, and then you rely on Kafka as uh, the mechanism for using the events that have been generated uh, from Axon applications to the downstream systems. So you can have the best of both worlds, and this is this is what uh, it, it's all about. So. Uh, you use Axon uh, for its event sourcing capabilities, and you know since it's uh, it's available out of the box, while uh, utilizing Kafka. To explain that, uh, to expand that a bit more, is you know Axon applications you know have uh, have events that are being generated uh, all the time, uh, but these events could be used from within Axon applications or within services that participate within an Axon applications. And there are certain events that are deemed necessary that, that need to be published to the downstream systems, uh, which are also known as milestone events. 
And that's where Kafka plays an important role. So you could have uh, events that are being generated out of Axon and then published onto Kafka uh, uh, to rely on Kafka to have uh, the event delivered to downstream systems uh, for, the for the specific events that you do consider important uh, for, for the entire enterprise's ecosystem. And Axon provides a pretty nifty con connector to do that. So the extensions, uh, the, as part of Axon extensions, that is a specific Kafka connector that is made available uh, that you can use to build uh, to, uh, and integrate it within your Axon framework-based applications to have events that persisted onto the event store and have those events delivered at the same time to the downstream system utilizing Kafka. And that gives you the best of both worlds. So it's a compelling proposition. Uh, you use uh, the, the right tools for the job, as I said, you use Axon for event sourcing, and then you use Kafka as your even streaming platform for uh, downstream uh, delivery. That's all I had today to speak about uh, between Axon uh, and Kafka. Uh, the the extension uh, is it's 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 available today for usage. And uh, you know, uh, good luck with your event sourcing and event streaming uh, journey. Thank you.